Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. Have you ever heard the phrase, if mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy? There's a lot of truth to that phrase. In fact, I think we can apply it to all women in general. If women aren't happy, ain't nobody happy. And you have to forgive me for saying the word ain't. That is not typically in my vocabulary, but I did that for emphasis on the quote. And often, I have to say, as women who strive for success, we are caught in the middle of trying to do it all and do it all well. The question is, can we as women have it all? I believe yes, but maybe not at the same time. And my, today, my guest today is Viate Chalette, and she is no stranger to this concept. In fact, she shares her thoughts in her book, Happy Women, Happy World. Let's dive in and learn her original time-based ego rhythm concept, which will help you to define what is most important during the various stages of life. Without further ado, Beate, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thank you so much, Robin, for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yes, I think it's going to be a good one. But before we dive in, will you please tell the listeners a little bit about you and your journey to get to the point where you are today? Sure. So my name is Beata Chalette. I'm known as the growth architect. I'm the founder of the Women's Code. And I work with visionaries and thought leaders to help them grow their authority and scale their impact. And what that means is that I have a natural affinity to strategies, processes, and systems. And I help people to figure out where they want to go and get clarity around that goal. And then design the strategy that you need to get there develop the systems that we need to have in place to scale that journey so that they can have freedom of time and money eventually. And I'm originally from Germany, so I immigrated to the United States. I have a photography degree. I came here. I was working as an employee. I was laid off with a small child going through a divorce. And then I had to figure out over a very grueling, brutal story that I write in detail in my book about how do I get to a place where I can support my family of one in a country that's not my own without any support while I'm going through fires, floods, riots, earthquake, a tsunami, September 11th, and a lawsuit where the hits just kept coming. Eventually, I'm $135,000 in debt, and I think it's game over. And then I had to figure out how to crack that code. And when I did, I sold my business to millions uh, for millions to Bill Gates. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. So first, I think it's so cool. We have so many similarities because I have a background as a professional photographer as well. And I am totally into systems and processes and automation and all of those behind the scenes things that help us implement those strategies that we create more effectively. And I love time and money freedom. So Okay. So that's fascinating. You sold your business to Bill Gates. What was that original business? That is as uh, that was a stock photography business called Beata Works oh, okay. that that was uh, specialized in architecture, interior and celebrity homes. So the celebrity home aspect was what made us the world leader in our category. And that's how we became, you know, an interesting target for a uh, Corbis that had owned outline. They had bought a high, high, high end celebrity portraiture at a company and they needed to, to build that out and add more revenue stream to that because they couldn't grow the brand because it was a high touch brand and so literally we were the only opportunity in the market for them to even grow that brand oh that's so cool i love that okay so tell us a little bit about what you're doing today in terms of your book and ego rhythm i would like to talk, start there and talk a little bit about that and then i would like to talk about how um, if women are happy, the world is happier. So I, if that's okay, can we start that way? Yes. So I wrote the book, happy woman, happy world, because especially when I was at, at Corbis, when I was in the corporate world, I was absolutely shocked how there are different measures in how men operate and how women operate. And when I was looking at that and stuff happens on the weekends, on the golf course, over dinner that you weren't even invited. You didn't even know any of this happened. And you come in Monday morning and stuff's been decided. And you go like, when did that happen? Or you you fly up to a meeting in a different city and they had the pre-meeting in the morning that you were not invited because your plane wasn't even there yet. And by the time you get there, everything is decided. You're like, what am I even doing here? 
And I looked at this and I realized not just are men having a different code, which I call the men's code, but that women have no code and that women are looking at each other at a, at a very large percentage as a competition and they start taking each other out. And then I looked at the numbers and I saw that women must get dumber over time because as long when women stay in careers longer, their career trajectory falls to a very small percentage, whereas men must magically get a lot smarter as they go further in their careers, which is why men have 97% of CEO positions and women only three. So when I did the graphics and I, I looked at this, we started about 50-50 and then women just completely fall off. And then I listened to what the stories were that were told about why women did that and that women make conscious decisions to have babies. And then uh, that becomes more important. And they really don't want to work so hard. They don't really want the career. They don't know how to how to how to be a mom and have a career at the same time. That's on women, by the way, not the society, not the support system, not the men. It's all on women. And I looked at this and I'm like, this is a bunch of BS. This is ridiculous. I mean, we are the biological gender that has been has been charged with making sure the human race is in, can survive. I think that by itself is a pretty magical, magical thing. I was just watching my daughter give birth two weeks ago. And as I'm in the room and I see, you know, little baby Kaliana's head come and then the baby comes out. I mean, that in order for you to do that, you got to be pretty freaking fabulous. Uh, I may mm. just say that <laughs> to to be able to be able to do something like that. And yet women constantly get punished for that. And so I wrote the book, The Women's Code, under the premise that I said, so here's how we are going to actually make an impact in the world. First, we have to come together as women. We have to recognize that young women and older women or, you know, the, the poorly aging feminist and the hot young chick that the hot young chick is on the trajectory of becoming the poorly aging feminist, because that's not on whether or not she decides that is what she wants to do. That is the code on how it's been written and every woman follows that. So you have to, in order to change that, come in at the very beginning and say, we need to change that assumption of that I did something wrong, you know, now obviously I'm aged, I aged myself because I'm a grandparent. But what, why does that make me an angry feminist? Why does this make me a cat lady? Why does this make me somebody who is angry at men, which neither one of these is true, neither am I angry, nor do I have cats. And I am in a relationship. So I think that there is so much assumption that we as women first, with this women's code that I wrote, and that's why I wrote the book, need to come together and say, how do we want to act? Where do we want to come from? How do we? How do I want to behave toward other women and make it inappropriate to behave like, you know, like a, a, a she tyrant or like the, a lot of the behavior that women do? And the reason women do that, because they operate from the scarcity principle. And that's why I wrote the book. Mm, I love that you bring that into play. And we've had conversations on the show before about comparison and about competition. We have to have competition or there's no marketplace. And the key is being confident enough in yourself to be able to differentiate yourself versus putting someone else down. And we see this all the time. People are putting other people down to build themselves up, most notably in political campaigns, it's all the negative, 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 negative. And it's not about the competition because we all bring something to the table and we all bring something unique to the table and how we present that becomes our key into developing the relationships and building our own self up, our own business up or our own corporate position up. Um, so when you talk about the ego rhythm and I loved this, this concept when we were talking just before the show started, is, um, you know, we tend to look at each other and compare ourselves to each other and think that we have to do and be what everyone else is. And then we're trying to become tenfold what we're actually created to be. And I would love for you to touch on that just a little bit as well. 
Yeah. So when I took a look around and I found that there's something that I call in the book, the superhuman paradox. And the superhuman paradox means that you believe that when we look at our girlfriend, so I have a girlfriend, Kelly, Kelly's been married for 35 years. I mean, if anybody's got that figured out, it's her. So I want to be like Kelly when it comes to the relationship, which I'm clearly not, but I want to be like that. Then I have a friend who is a maniac in workout, right? So Monica, I mean, when you see her body, I mean, she does triathlons. She's training right now. Pilates, running, swimming, bicycle. I mean, you look at her and you go, girlfriend, that is hot. So I want her body. Then I look at my my daughter's mother-in-law, Kelly, who is just an unbelievable mom. I mean, she loves doing your laundry. She loves going in your kitchen and, you know, cooking and then cleaning everything up. I mean, that's so I want to be like that. So I look at all of my friends and I say, that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want. And then I look at myself and I come short in just about everything because that's not what I'm good at naturally. What I'm good at is something different. I can help people to figure out how to make their dream happen. I can motivate them. I can get them in the right mindset. I can tell them on how to crack this business code or how to be you know, successful entrepreneurs or how to make transitions from, uh, from corporate to this, or I can help women in corporate positions to understand what their unapologetic value proposition is because I can see what makes people special. And that's so simple for me that I don't understand how other people cannot do that. But I'm not that, and I'm not that, and I'm not that. So I looked at this and I said, women have this tendency, specifically women, men do it too, but women specifically have this tendency to feel like complete failures because they're not the conglomeration of the best attributes of all the people that we admire. Now, if I talk about it like that, you know, it, it just sounds like, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, no, nobody's perfect, but yet we try. And so the concept of egorhythm was born to say, well, if that is one of the reasons women drive themselves crazy, then how do I, what concept do I need to develop to help women understand that there are seasons, waves, rhythms in life? I have never in my life, you know, gone into the park in the winter and heard trees cry over how they look and, oh gosh, they don't have a single leaf on it. What should people think about that? Um, you know, I'm the worst tree ever. I mean, look at me. I'm completely barren. I mean, people, people, I'm ashamed people looking at me. That doesn't happen in nature. The tree just goes its winter. Got to let go of the trees, of all my leaves in the, in the spring. You know, I'll sprout back up again in the summer. I'm the prettiest. But, but nature doesn't worry about that. The squirrel doesn't run around and say, oh, crap, you know, um, there's no, there's no nut right here. What am I going to do? And, the, 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 you know, there's no squirrel psychology training, the squirrel just goes and keeps looking until it finds other nuts. But we, on the other hand, constantly drives ourselves crazy. So I said, so what if there is in this rhythm of life, which is why I call it ego, my own rhythm, not the ego, the enemy, but ego as in my rhythm, unapologetically, that I look at life and I say, you know, for all the mothers out there, when you have a baby, you lose your complete sense of self for the first three years because it's all about the child. By the time from three to six, the child changes, it develops sense of self from six to nine. It's a great time. They're amazing. You know, they do fun stuff. Nine to 12 is still all good. 12, the storm clouds are moving in. 12 to 15, God help us. Uh, 15 to 18, go with God, but go. And then, uh, and then eventually they come back and they tell you you've been a great mother. So if I look at this and I knew this would happen and there was a rhythm, then what does that mean for me? It means that I need to learn how to set a main focus for a rhythm at a time, one rhythm at a time. So if I'm a new mother and I know that my daughter at 12 will yell at me, I hate you, then would I not enjoy these first three years a lot more? But I didn't know. Nobody told me. it, So I, I, I fought all the way. And that's what this concept of egorhythm is. So there's nine egorhythm from motherhood to tragedy, to career, to love, where you get to figure out where am I right now and what rhythm do I want to be in and then make that 
what we call the main focus. I love that. And so much of what you said reminded me of contentment. If we can look around where we are and establish what our focus is at the present moment, we can learn to be content in the life that we're living. And I guess quiet some of those voices that say you have to be like her or you need to be like her or you need to accomplish this because so-and-so did. So I like that um, you have that emphasis on the here and now and this part of your journey and how to focus on that for opportunities of ultimate growth, ultimate achievement versus trying to spin in or trying to achieve so much that you're ultimately just spinning in circles. You're right. I I was watching this documentary on uh, Mark Madsen's book, The Art of Not Giving a Bleep. Mm-hmm. And, and he had this simple idea, which was which really moved me. And he basically, Robin says, hypothetically speaking, if we all knew we had the same outcome, just hypothetically speaking, we knew we had the same outcome, which means we all die. What would you have to do to reverse engineer the journey? So when you get there, you can go out with a party. And then I thought about this and it's it's almost laughable because it's kind of ridiculously silly, but yet so profound because I think people... People fight that exit. Like my mom is 88, my mother-in-law is 92, and they're all fighting this exit. It's not, they they are afraid to think about that. And I'm wondering if we are talking about rhythms of life and if we talk about what matters, then do I really need to spend my entire life worrying about that and how far I can push this off and squeezing out one more day Or would I not rather say, I know what my guaranteed outcome is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. I like that too. And I think, you know, when you live your life from a place of contentment and a place of doing what you're called to do, serving other people and living in the moment and not pressuring yourself to be something that you aren't called to be you can ultimately have that experience at the end. But we get so inundated with social media, with the news, with everything we consume that we think we have to strive to be something that we're not technically. And it's funny how even in, and we can bring the entrepreneurial journey in now too, and how as entrepreneurs, we tend to compare ourselves to other people. And that's one of the disadvantages I feel of social media is that you're seeing Mm -hmm. what everybody else is doing and what they're putting out there. They're only showing you a small portion of what it's actually like inside their life and their business. But yet we look at that and think, oh, I have to do that now because it's working for them. But it all comes back full circle to what differentiates you, what makes you unique? Because when we look at And this is where I think you and I both have that gift of helping other people identify what makes them unique. Because when we're in our own head, we lose track. We lose sight of the fact that every part of our journey has led us right to where we are today. And even without a certificate or a degree or, you know, a million years of experience, our own individual journeys have given us everything we need to be able to help someone else who needs exactly what we've learned from the experiences we've had. You're touching on a super important point, Robin. And I think that's why I like your work so much because you, you always talk about in social media to not get caught up in that and to really focus on the things that matter, not the external window dressing. And we are so busy in using a lot of this internet marketing trap that others have created, a lot of the men have created, is to keep us always wanting more. And I I look at this and I've really started recently speaking out against that, saying that you when you when you are spending all this time on searching outside, then what happens is that you're constantly seeing what you don't have. That's what the whole internet marketing is set out to do. So you think you need to learn how to speak from stage only for the next affiliate offer to come in to help you create a product 
only for the next affiliate offer to come in to help you do an online course, for the next affiliate offer to come in to do a product launch, for the next affiliate offer to come in to get the leads, for the next affiliate offer to, uh, then you have to hack the funnel. And for the next affiliate offer to get better at sales. And next thing you spend five years of your life, $150,000, you have what, 15 unrelated things, 400 learning hours, you're so overwhelmed, you're not a step further. And this is what this is entirely set out to do, is to make you want to be better without a plan. And that's where you and I really come in and say, how about we make the plan first? And then we'll tell you from all the things you have, what are we plugging in here? Mm -hmm. And then once we've plugged in here, we take a look, what do you really want? I like speaking. What I don't like about speaking, if I speak in New York, I have to travel there for a full day. Then I speak for an hour or 90 minutes. Then I either go back that day. That's a lot of travel for two days. Mm -hmm. Or I, I take advantage of the event that I'm at. I do the networking and I fly back the next day. So now it's three days. So if I want to be a successful speaker and I want to speak, let's say, 100 times a year. Well, there's your math. That's it. You all have a life. And so you you want to be very clear what the consequence of the model that you pick is to yourself and to your family and the lifestyle, freedom of time and money. So now you're a slave to the airline industry and you're constantly stressed out. I mean, last time I checked travel, really, especially right now, is really not that enjoyable because the seats are you know, the seats are a little tiny and uh, people are just jerks right now on, on, on planes. So do I like that? So, so, so podcasting then is better. Well, great. So now, now you have a different strategy, but I, I believe the, it's okay to look to the outside for ideas. It is not okay to try to emulate everything. There has to be a discriminatory, um, my friend Krista Grasso calls it the, re the unnecessary complexity. I love that term. I told her, yeah, I said, I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so why are you constantly creating unnecessary complexity? So we literally made this year a choice and said, what do we, what do we let go of? We got, we, we let go of of iCloud servers, we let go of software, we we are moving our CRM, we are literally, we, we let go of all the things that create unnecessary complexity in a desire to simplify. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing in 2022. And when I got rid of 14, 14 systems that either I wasn't using or I was paying for, and I could eliminate that cost by going with one platform. And what a difference, what a difference it makes when you simplify. But I think back to our original conversation or what we were originally talking about is we've been in this guy's world, man's world, where we're taught that everything is complicated. Nothing is smooth sailing and we have to push and strive and compete to get to where we're going. So anytime we see something that looks like it's going to help be better, make us better, make us stronger, make us earn more money, we are tempted to dive into it or purchase it or learn it. And that's where we get ourselves completely hung up in unnecessary complexities. <laughs> Well, that's where the femininity now comes in. And you and I, we we had a conversation about this, where if we look at what is needed right now, so if I look at this generation, I was joking to my daughter as a millennial, I said, if if you would have told me that as a millennial, you are now judging another generation, Gen Z, because you felt that we were judging your generation. Now you are the generation that judges the next generation. I said, isn't that kind of ha-ha funny? But this new generation of Gen Zs, they want to be more aligned with both aspects of femininity and masculinity. I've never seen so many straight men wear nail polish. And no, uh, I know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it. And does it matter how I feel about it? They like it. 
But I think that there is an, a desire to have an exploration of what is a feminine aspect? What is a masculine aspect? And they are anxious, depressed, and uh, frustrated at the highest rate of any generation we've ever seen. And they're only like in their early 20s. Mm-hmm. So I do believe that this masculine business code or this masculine, the men's code, is really not working for men so much anymore either. No matter how hard a particular group of people, especially in politics, is trying to hold on to that and make that the non plus ultra, but that there is a part about a feminine energy where people say, "Does everything have to be a fight? Do I have to be competitive twenty four seven? Do I do I do I have to wipe out my competition? Does winning really mean everybody has to lose? Is there enough for everybody?" So I think these questions are being really asked, and that's where I think the women's code is really coming back into this to say. There is a place for femininity mm-hmm. and for a softer energy and for a heart-centered energy and for consciousness. Yeah. And, you know, I think there is, and you know what? This whole conversation loops back to contentment. People are not content because they're not learning who they are inside. They're looking to everything externally to soothe themselves or to make themselves better instead of doing the internal work, the mindset work, the heart-centered work, the inner child work, all of those things that are going to help them navigate the challenges they're faced with. I mean, this the world that our Gen Z, my kids are Gen Z, that they're living in is so completely different night and day than the world I grew up in. Yeah. And I don't envy them one bit, but I think that there has been so many confusion from the, so much confusion from the generations above them of I have to be this big top guy or I have to be this beautiful yeah. feminine. And, you know, it's really a combination of the two, like you said, that's going to help have that heart centered nature that's going to develop relationships that are going to offer long term career growth, future, you know, relationships with significant others, with spouses. And I think it's really important to, to take a step back and say, okay, the nail polish isn't going to make you a better person. It may make you feel more feminine or more in line with the culture of today, but is that the solution to your problem? And I think that's where, like we were talking about earlier, we have to break away from what society is saying on social media. People are dictating behaviors. And when we succumb to those or when Gen Z succumbs to those, that's when we lose sight of humanity. Yeah, I, I think you have a point there that if I if I think about this, we had, I, I mean, every generation has had that external pressure. We, my generation had this specifically for my parents. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the after World War II generation. There were kids when in, in World War II and I come from Germany. So that's very prevalent. Very prevalent. And, 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 and that idea is you have to work hard. Mm-hmm. You have to work before you get to play well the work really never ends so you never get to play which yeah. is what i struggle with because that's what i've been taught and the constant you have to be better you have to prove yourself you have to make sure you keep up with the joneses and so i grew up with this part but if we to your point recognize that every generation has a challenge or a built in trigger based upon what the other generation thought they learned from the generation before them to not do. And then they screwed up something else. If we knew that, that every generation has this baggage that they give to the next generation, then, then I think we'll be better off. But I had this conversation with someone who is 25, who said to me, I have a right to be happy. I need to live in my passion and my purpose. And I'm not, and I feel like I'm failing. I'm like, dude, you're 25. You don't know that happiness is a decision that you make and then you take consistent actions for the rest of your life to declare that you're happy and it's a mindset thing and it's a soul thing. And then you you live in that space, reminding yourself on how blessed you are, live in gratitude, really recognizing the happiness is a muscle that you train. Didn't know that. Uh, Passion and purpose. Did you know that passion and purpose is something, it's also a lifelong quest. I mean, who, who, who woke up? Very few people wake up and say, I want to be a chef. And then that's it. Most people, 
Most people say, yeah, I thought I did, but then I didn't like it that much. What's wrong with me? There is an expectation for this particular generation that, and I think this has a lot to do with how social media has trained them to believe that you have to have this figured out much sooner than you really can because the 20s are messy. The 20s Mm -hmm. are a mess. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, it's, they're complicated. It's not It's not about finding the solution the first time you try something. You have to explore and you have to give yourself the opportunity to learn and grow as an individual and not follow suit with everybody else and what everybody else is doing. You have to discover for yourself what's right for you. And I love how you brought in the soul because it really is a soul purpose. And it's really you know your decision to choose happiness to take the action to become happy and to live your life happy, it all starts from inside. It's not going to come from external sources, no matter what pressures you're under from those external sources or what pressures you're putting on yourself. So, well, and, and I, I, I would like to ask you that question, Robin, on your own show is, has your purpose always been the same throughout your life? Oh, heavens. No. I mean, I went to college, got a doctorate degree in pharmacy from there. I became a professional photographer and look at me today. I'm now a marketing strategist and business coach, you know, it's, but let's look at that for a second, because I think this is where you and I both have that unique gift is you, I can look at my journey and I can see how every single job I had, role I had, interaction I had, relationship I had led me right to where I am today to have that insight. You know, and I think God, God creates us to be so incredibly unique that each step of our journey just adds to that. And every, everything is, you know, if, if you think of us as a pawn on the chessboard, we're God's, we're God's pawns on the chessboard of life, right? And everything's planned out. There's a strategy for us that he's already created. And here we are. And I really feel like for the first time, like this is my legs are planted. I stand firm, you know? I finally discovered, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm done. I'm still passionate about so many other things. And I still love to write. I love to do this. And I love to do that. The sky is the limit when you open your heart and your mind to the opportunities that are presented to you. And I think this is where like working with someone like you, working with someone like me, you open the door to so many more opportunities because we can see something in someone that they don't see in themselves. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think it's important also to point out that opportunities never show up as opportunities. No. They're always a challenge. Mm-hmm. When I Every when time. I sold my when I sold my business, or right before I sold my business, what led this to what the initiation of this was a, a, a former mother in law who would was the was such a nagger, and she constantly nagged me that with all the misfortune I had after having lost the you know big part of the business in September 11th and the other part in the lawsuit that. She says, you need to write the president of the United States. And I'm like, who the heck writes the president of the United States? And so I wrote the letter to the president of the United States just so I did not have to listen to this anymore. And then when the letter from the White House came right after the worst moment of my life, when I had lost my father and uh, I was being thrown out of the house I lived in and I had no idea how I was going to how, how I was going to survive. I'm hundred thirty five thousand dollars in debt. And then I get a letter from the White House. But the letter put me in touch with the Small Business Administration, an organization in the United States helping uh, businesses to secure funding. And they put me in touch with a second in command because they also got a letter from the White House. And then they found me a bank. It restructured my debt, freed up my line of credit. Now I'm suddenly three months later, instead of bankruptcy, I'm break, break even. That's how close it was. And then 18 months later, I'm the world leader in my category, and that leads a Bill Gates company to buy me from a letter that somebody nagged me to write. So that was not an opportunity at that time. That was a challenge. Uh But that challenge turned into an opportunity. So I do also think it's important, Robin, for us to point out that opportunities don't come with a big fed sign that's flashing with little gold stars on it, I'm an opportunity. It comes with something they go, oh, no way. That's what forces you to resolve something. I think especially right now, because people, I know that a lot of the consultants and coaches having a hard time 
signing clients and finding good leads right now because money is a lot tighter than it was last mm -hmm. year and the year before. Mm -hmm. So if people during COVID and the pandemic have bought all these things, these high ticket things and learned and learned because the government paid them. And now after this, what do you think is next? What's next is that they now need to execute. They don't want to buy anything else. They want to execute. So is the reason why so many coaches and consultants are not selling enough right now because there's been a shift and they haven't figured out that people don't want to learn another thing. People want to take what they have and implement that now and, and fulfill their goals. So then how would that shift your business? So if that challenge is that you're not making the sales right now, you need to hire somebody like Robin. You need to hire somebody like me because we don't sell you a thing. We help you to figure out what the strategy is to take the thing and have a business with that thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the differentiation factor right now. But I look at all the big marketers and I see even they have noticed the shift. Yeah. Yep. 100%. Oh, Beate, I could talk to you all day long. This is such a great, <laughs> such a great conversation. And we're so aligned with our beliefs and what, you know, our mission is and how we're working with other people. And I think that's really super cool. And it's a perfect example of there's no competition here. Or if there is competition, it's healthy competition that generates more business for both of us because we can ultimately collaborate and we could support each other versus saying, ah, you're in my space. So I love that. Yeah, it, I, I think it's always so interesting when somebody says, well, you know, she's taken all my jobs away from me. N no, uh, I mean, there's millions of businesses. Even if you were the most amazing and if I was the most amazing uh, consultant, coach, trainer in the world, there's not a chance you could do a million businesses. I mean, it's just physically not possible. Right. So if we, if we remember, if let's say, let's say you have a thousand that are fitting for you, that's plenty business. That's plenty money. That's plenty opportunity. It's plenty scaling, changing. Mm -hmm. That still leaves many other thousands out there for other people. So that's what we're here for. We're here for to tell your audience, listen to what resonates with you and follow that. But that's only one part of the journey. There is no consultant, coach, strategist out there that has it all. But we help you with a plan to figure out what else is needed and what you need to let go of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And here we are now full, cir full circle to where we started with you know, really prioritizing that focus of where you are right now and making the best of what you have and what you can do. So, okay. Will you please tell the listeners where they can find you, connect with you, learn more from you? Yeah. So number one, if you heard something about the women's code that you're curious about, go get the book, Happy Woman, Happy World. It's available on Amazon as an audiobook, a printed book, and as an ebook. And uh, if you want to connect, reach out anywhere on social media, either under my name, Beata Shalit or The Growth Architect. And if you are stuck in your business and you want to know what your number one business growth blocker is, check out our quiz at growthblockerquiz.com. In two minutes, the quiz will tell you which area you're stuck and what you need to do to remove that business growth blocker. I love it. Listeners, if you found this information helpful, will you please do me a favor and leave us a rating and review? That is how we get to share more incredible guests with you like Beate. And if you would be so kind also to share this episode with anybody that you know is struggling with their business or has experienced those, let's say, min code attributes in a negative way <laughs> and could find this information helpful, share it with them as well. All right. I wish you guys a great week and we'll see you here next time.